All right, well, welcome back from your coffee break. I hope you're all caffeinated. Um, just, I'm only gonna go through four or five slides, a little bit of data, a little bit of context setting. I'd actually just start by building off of um, some of the comments that Jeff made, which uh, actually Spencer and I chatted yesterday and he knows that it's true. We had no idea exactly what the content of uh, Jeff's uh, conversation was gonna be, which I think was really interesting. And a couple of the key points that he made actually lead into the context setting that I've got before us here. So first is, I would just say, kind of going back in time, um, an another part, this first slide, which really talks about the rise of the internet. There's lots of different data that you can look at. This happens to be from the United States, the 15 and over population. And what it says is that during the daytime, from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m., when um, in the United States, that's pretty much the only time people can be guaranteed with broadband access, because we're still not quite there in terms of whole broadband penetration. The internet's uh, reach and the amount of engagement by the American population is actually larger on the internet than on television. And as you can see, even in the evening time periods, it's fairly competitive. So there's clearly a lot of bad news amongst us in terms of the macroeconomic environment, but I think one of the positive things that we can count on in this environment, in this very challenging environment going forward, and this touches on the 260 and the $180 per month that Jeff was talking about that the average American household spends on communication and sort of subscription at home entertainment and communication services, broadband, cable, as well as mobile. That has historically been the one thing in an economic downturn that families are loath to give up. They cut sort of discretionary entertainment, things like going to the movies, things like buying more music. They tend to, uh, as a as for those of you who remember the 80s, I was at a board meeting last week and I mentioned sort of the one good thing about the internet audience, you know, ad dollars are gonna be tough, spending's gonna be tough, but at least we know the audience is really gonna be there. People are gonna be cocooning, remember Faith Popcorn? And the entrepreneur looked at me blankly and said, you mean the 80s, you mean before the internet? I said, yes, before the internet. Remember that? Not exactly. Well, anyway, I think the analogy there is that the rise, if, if for those of us who remember, the rise of digital cable, um, which has been uh, in the 90s, but just in the penetration of cable, spending more time consuming more entertainment services at home in times of macroeconomic distress is something that we can look back to in other recessionary time periods. And I hope will be from an audience perspective one of the things that this audience and all of us can count on, um, at least in terms of engagement, which I think is the key metric. Uh, this is just a quick point to say that what does distributed media mean? Another not as nice way to say it could have been basically the deportalization of the internet. The top chart here shows, look, if you just want a base reach, it still looks pretty good. You can get to 75, 78% reach of the internet audience if you just as an advertiser want to buy on the top three portals plus Google. But if you look at the bottom chart, the chart in blue, uh, what it says is that the engagement in those sites, which in the past has been 80 plus percent of overall audience engagement, is now if you add up those four bars, it's only 20 percent of the engagement is on those large sites. And so that gets to sort of the context setting for what is distributed media and why should we all care. So part of it's been enabled by um, Google and guys like Saranga search as the new metaphor for how you find things has made it on the one hand much easier to find lots and lots of sites so you don't have to start your internet uh, information or media experience at a portal in a very set pieces of tabs and here's where you go and here's what you do. So in a way search has really made the distributed internet possible. At the same time on the other hand tools, whether it's things like OpenX for small publishers, and it's literally 60, 70,000 publishers of all stripes that Tim will talk about, or things like TypePad and WordPress have made it much easier for individuals or small publishers to create content that's high quality and to monetize that content. So there was a question before about how do you deal with the cost of content creation? I think the answer is you distribute it, you put it in the hands of the people, uh, and you've created a great set of tools to make it a lot easier to create a high quality website today as an individual person spending three hours a day 
uh, as compared to what it used to be to create a website back in even in 99 or 2000. So those two trends at the same time have really given rise to what we've been calling distributed media. And that's really shown from the numbers and the engagement sense and that shift away from the Yahoo, MSN, AOLs of the world to the thousands if not hundreds of other sites. Uh, and they're found through search. So that's all great because people are all over the place, but as an advertiser, how do you reach the audience that you want uh, in some sort of context besides advertising on search, which is terrific, but how do I advertise against certain audiences, certain behaviors? There were some gentlemen in the demo today that talked about different ways to target people, whether it's semantically, behaviorally, or a variety of diff different other angles. There's a tried and true way that you know advertisers and content creators have thought about reaching audiences as well, which is providing some sort of context. The idea of providing channelization, to use an old world uh, term, to the internet is another lens where you can take advantage of the highly cost-effective and distributed content generation of hundreds or thousands of publishers and creators as well as they provide interesting audience aggregation of your most interested, your most fanatical, to use the hockey analogy that was used before, fans, if they know to search out the 20 small blog sites about uh, the Montreal Canadien or the uh, Quebec Nordique, I'm not sure if they're still around, then that means that they're really your hardcore audience. That sounds terrific. I, as an advertiser who cares about that audience, I want to reach them. But I'm not going to go and advertise on 100 or 1,000 or maybe even 50 sites. And each individual site is too small to be interesting. The content may be very high quality. It's been created very cost effectively. And it is, in fact, my most deeply engaged and passionate audience. So the answer and answer, in addition to search, which has been a very effective online advertising tool, is the idea of creating channelization and using a mixture of technology to enable the great creation of thousands and thousands of content sites, as well as humans and editorial using leveraged technology um, to create these lenses so that advertisers can, can get a mass audience with deep engagement in the places where they spend time today, which are on these thousands of fragmented distributed sites and no longer on the centralized internet. So with that, I will hand it over to our moderator. Thank you. Should I use which? I guess I can use this mic. Okay. Um, one of the interesting things to me is that, you, for instance, if you look at ad buying, how many ad networks are there? I think I've seen the number of 300. Is that? So you, you've had this similar kind of fragment. You know, you once upon a time, I mean, I think the, the, the big media buyers, if that's the other comparison, the top four media buyers in the world buy 75% of the ads or something like that. Now suddenly we've exploded out into this world. Is it going to stay that way? I mean, Glam is a big, is a big player in a big ocean, too. What do you, where do you see that going? Are, you, are all 300 going to survive? Um, I think it's a really good question is, you know, just like this fragmentation on the media side, which right. is um, what Teresa's presentation really shows, there's just more and more websites, more and more video sources on the internet. And I do believe because of search and blogging, uh, it's driving fragmentation even further. Um, if you look on the advertising side for a second, you know, when someone says there's over 300 ad networks, that sounds like fragmentation also to right. me. Um, I think one of the largest single reasons of this fragmentation is if you, if you ask the question on what are the buckets of advertising. So you start with, of course, search and text-based advertising being one in which there's no fragmentation. You know, you've got Google that has probably 70%, if not 80% market share of that space. Um, and no real contenders. Mm -hmm. uh, that represents roughly half of all internet advertising today. So uh, and about half of the advertising side on the internet, there's no fragmentation. And then the remaining two big buckets are um, the remnant ad display business and the you know, emerging social networks media business and the emerging vertical networks business. Right now, the biggest fragmentation is on the display ad network sites. And that's all to do with the remnant advertising networks because there's so many uh, networks chasing a very, very diverse and fragmented base with some form of direct response. So my, my belief system is, I, I think sooner or later, Google will bring its model of 
uh, text advertising also to, to Remnant because that's a volume uh, game. Uh, which will deeply consolidate that market uh, very quickly. And then the question will be, you know, who will be the dominant players in social networks and vertical networks? We don't see a lot of overlap um, with ad networks because we technically would be users of them given, uh, you know, we're really on the premium side from but a vertical perspective. you're a publisher too, I mean, in a funny way. That, isn't that, I mean, are we seeing, I mean, I was talking with Jack Clues about this just before the panel yeah. started. The definition of a publisher and an advertiser and a buyer, all these definitions seem to be completely up in the air right now. That, that question actually is really the question um, that encouraged me to get out of the venture business and, and really be full-time on Glam. Uh, it was about three years ago, and uh, we were looking at the data from the usage of media on the internet. And what I found to my surprise was the only conclusion I could drive from the data was that the definition of media was changing. Um, and I think that's embedded in your question, which is media largely has meant a few branded titles of the hits business uh, on, you know, owned by a few media companies in which distribution is tightly controlled, either in print to, through magazine or book distribution or in television by number of channels. On the internet, because distribution is not controlled or controllable, mm -hmm. Uh, you end up with 160 million content websites today. So you can bring forward your definition of what is a media company. As we all know, till I think three years ago, most people did not consider Google a media company because they were either a search or an AdSense ad network. Uh, it's very clear they're a media company today. Saranga, you're, it's not, you mean you are in, in, in competing with Google in many ways. How do, you, how, do you, how do you characterize everybody else in the world and, and then Google in, in that in the kind of terms that, that he was just discussing. I mean, how? Yeah, um, I, I'm not sure I can um, stand up to the to the lofty height of saying that we compete directly with Google. Um, that that that's a tall order for anybody. Um, the I think the fragmentation and distribution issue is really interesting because on the one hand, you do have fragmentation. So if you watch people and how they use the web today, more and more of them um, start off on a page that's completely unique to themselves whether that's a Google results page based on a search, whatever they needed to look for right, right now when they first started the morning, or whether it's some kind of um, login page on a, on a Facebook or a MySpace or whatever else. Um, so in that sense, portals in the traditional sense are absolutely dying. Um, you know, people don't just go to yahoo.com or aol.com as the first page and actually read all the stuff that's there that's designed for everybody or everybody in their region or wherever, whatever the, the vertical sort of slice was. On the other hand, we do also look for centralized services too. Um, I call this sort of almost the Google curse. I don't know about the rest of you, but every time I go into a meeting now, I have to Google the person that I'm about to go and see. Even if it's someone I know surprisingly well, I always check. I'm sure most of you do too. Um, now, the, the weird thing is, it, it started off being very useful. You'd, you'd search for the person, you'd find two or three hits on them, and you'd know, you know enough about them very, very quickly. Nowadays, I find myself stuck there 10 minutes later reading page 25, page 26, page 27 about each and every person. And it's, it's this thing that we all have where because there's so much stuff out there and we feel we need to know all of it, we need something like a very, very centralized, powerful service like a Google that tells us everything about a given topic or a person or whatever our current focus is. So that argues for centralization, for having one place where you can find everything, which is what we do at Blinks. We're a video search engine, so we're one place of finding all video. But the first argument argues for fragmentation. Everyone starts in a different place, so you can't reach them. So there's a real, really interesting, in my opinion, dichotomy there that, that, that's very difficult to understand. And it, I think the way it's going is it's about providing the latter into the former. So you've got to admit that people aren't going to come to your site and only your site, because there is no single site that everyone's going to come to. So the, the idea of there being one homepage for all just dies. But if you're going to be successful, then you need to be something that does provide a complete service in whatever your focus or your niche or your vertical is. But you've got to make that embeddable wherever those people may be. So it's, it's about mixing the two, being a, being a central, dependable source in the way that Google is for finding out about somebody, but on the other hand, being applicable wherever those people happen to be. Well, okay, then here's something, I mean, bring, bring Tim into this. You know, on the one hand, you've got, if you look at YouTube, you could say, wow, this is a fantastically centralized thing. It's the repository of some very large percentage of the watchable video. On the other hand, each of the little pieces of it are separately searchable and listable in blinks and by anybody else. So it's simultaneously highly centralized and highly distributed. Now, 
Tim, part of your business, as I understand, is 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 helping people who are not in centralized right. systems. I mean, how can it, it, how is that going to? I mean, the, I always think of the web as sort of this combination of centrifugal forces flinging things outward and centripetal forces pulling them in. How is that playing out now on the ground? Well, let, let me, you know, really, advertising is about matching uh, commercial messages to consumer intent um, and consumer attention. And the beauty of what's happening today in the non-search environment is people are becoming ever more expressive about who they are, what they're interested in, and how they want to kind of pursue their interests and passion online. And so we call that fragmentation. But I think it, in a better word is diversification, which is people are becoming more and more expressive. And actually that's, if you think about search, that's why search works so very well as an advertising model, because the person is putting in, in real time, exactly what they're interested in, and the paid search model captures that on the back end and makes a ton of money out of it. Now, if you think about what's happened over the last few years in the non-search part of the web, people are getting deeper and deeper, and they're not only diversifying their interests, their, their interest expression is getting deeper because they're not just consuming, they're contributing and they're participating. So to me, that's actually gold. Gold is being created before our eyes in an enormous scale. The problem is, that we are, have not created the platforms on the advertising side to capture and monetize that attention and intent in the non-search part of the world. Well, wouldn't, wouldn't Samira say that, I mean, isn't that one of the things So this is, so let me go to the question okay. about ad networks. Yeah. And I do think many ad networks will continue to prosper um, because what they do is they focus on certain segments and they focus on packaging. So in Samir's case, women and now men, and packaging those audiences, finding them across an array of sites, adding some value into them in the way that they interpret them, and then packaging them up, those up for advertisers. So I think there is a lot of value in that kind of intermediary function. Um, what we're trying to do is pa further package up audiences across the mid-market and tail, and then allow intermediaries and direct buyers to buy an audience at scale across many of these smaller so mediums. So you can work with Yes, so we would provide a service. In fact, we're trying something with uh, Samir's company that uh, can help aggregate those audiences from a myriad of small sites and then allow someone to say, you know, I'm looking for active women interested in kiteboarding, and they may be on 35,000 sites, and I certainly don't want to go and engage directly with each one of those sites. I want to go and buy them in a way that is very easy at a one-time buy to buy across an array of sites. So in other words, the advertiser can find them in the same way that a user who typed in yeah. women kiteboarding thing would come up with the 35,000 sites. Somewhat, yes. You so want to be able to push the ads out. Yes, in, in a distributed way that can actually speak to that fragmented audience in a scaled way. And that's kind of the dichotomy. The fragmentation of diversification is good because the underlying consumer attention is becoming more focused. But, but now, now, is all of this, again, another thing Jack and I were just talking about, uh, the ad itself. I mean, we have this, you know, it's essentially we've inherited, even though the 30-second thing has kind of died, the 60-second yep. thing has kind of died, but still the concept of an advert as a discrete thing that travels with content is... I wouldn't say it's an endangered species, but there's a lot of things circling around it that might have higher levels of engagement, for instance, yep. more conversational. There's a lot of different things coming down the pipe that, or, or adaptive ads, you know, the, you know but, all ads are different. I, I, I love what Calvin was talking about because I think my last job at Yahoo, I oversaw both display and search, and it kind of was a unique opportunity to compare the two. And the single biggest thing that struck me was in search, it's all about relevance. And the display, the word wasn't really in the lexicon. Right. Um, and I think one of the biggest issues we face, um, and I think we're beginning to address, is how do we make the ads useful? Uh, how do we make people look at them again and then engage in them? And I think some of the innovations that companies like Calvin's and others are, are doing to really understand what are the components of the ad, how do I speak to the audience, how do I understand that, how do I iterate on that, can help reinvent the space. And as you said, Driving up the CPMs is uh, pretty much the God's work right now. I uh, think, yeah, absolutely. I, I think your previous question and this are actually very tied together. Um, if you look at the evolution of media and take television or cable as the last medium, um, what stands out to me as really different about the internet is when you started broadcasting, you didn't go out and fill every available ad slot. And this is fundamental to why the internet 
in many ways is still a very small percentage of media, though it's almost equal or, or better than TV in prime time today. And what I mean by that is, imagine what would have happened to television as a medium, where the first thing that happened was that every single ad spot was filled with the lowest performing mm. ads. We would never have had the concept of prime time. So when we launched Glam, we did a couple of things very different, which are not really understood fully by people. The first thing we did was we said, we're not gonna place any ad network ads, none, zero. We're gonna first find what's premium and prime time, and only when we do that will we start to look at the mass ads. So I think you know, what he's saying, which is really important, is there's a vast number of companies, and there needs to be a lot more, that will help the problem we've created, which is right now, at least display ads, which are ad remnant, are put on sites with no regard to even the fact that there's no measurement that was the ad seen. Mm -hmm. you know, that, that's not a problem. A television has overage and you bake that in. Um, the, if you look at in television why national spots and other forms evolved and all of them grew, uh, it was in reaction to how people were both using and consuming advertising. So um, I think what Glam is doing, which is very different in a way from an ad network, is we start from the basic fact that instead of trying to find clusters after they've existed, we're starting by saying let's, let's predefine and make groups of uh, targeted audiences by channel in which an affinity already exists. Well, isn't that what publishers do? I mean, that's the traditional. That's exactly what a publisher does. If you look at a, te a television, you know, programming, that's that's the point. you know, it's you know, you're not sitting on NBC and saying let's make every show. You program a combination of shows that you build, movies that you buy, a license, uh, uh, stations that you own and operate, other station you affiliate with. It's bringing you know the the tradition the business models of traditional media to the internet, but adapting them to this fragmentation. So, right. so Spencer, Did, I want to ask oh, a question on okay. this. So sure. it sounds like everybody sort of agrees that, okay, the internet can allow for um, greater personalization. Mm -hmm. Certainly search does that, but we can mm -hmm. do that for ads, as well as we were talking about sort of programming. Here's a real question on the difference between a publisher and an ad network or an advertising and publishing online, which is now that you can create sort of um, mass content, very specialized and targeted. What's the true meaning of the separation of church and state between editorial and advertising online? I think it, it actually comes down to your total yield. I think the point you made is, is excellent. Look at a search page, go to Google and you'll notice not every time you get search ads at the top. Right? Why is that? Because they know, and Yahoo does the same, that you, not every query is commercial and you're not going to react very well to advertising for certain queries. Go to any other form of page, do you always get an ad, a display ad at the top, to, to yes. Samir's point, you always get one. Fundamentally, the page templates aren't set up not to show an ad, so you have to. So even if you don't have a paid ad, you're showing house ad. It's just an example of the way of thinking about what is the total user experience yield. And I don't mean yield just in an economic sense. I mean, it, I do, but in a long-term sense, which is how do I get the user to have an experience that is so good that they'll come back again and again and again, and the total lifetime value of that user of at, and the at, inter, way they interact with advertising will yield more for me as my business over time so that I may show them somewhat fewer ads. Or if they're in a section of the site where they have never clicked on an ad and they've been a, your user for two years, don't show them any ads. WordPress does this very well. They don't show repeat users to blogs ads because they know they're really there for the content. They tend to show early time users. So I think there's a lot that we can do in terms of the underlying targeting and how we structure the ad itself. And then thinking about how the ad operates in the context of the total experience is a very, very early stage uh, well, in the display. Speaking of early but, stages. But Tim, oh. is, is our, are the, I'm going to go back to your old days when you were at Yahoo. So Please the don't. paid inclusions, <laughs> yeah. is that an example of good or bad advertorial commingling? It depends on your point of view. That, that was a more controversial <laughs> one. Um, I think it comes, that comes down to, to relevance. Um, and the key there is making sure that the, even if the content is paid for, that it's highly relevant, that it stands by the same bar. Um, but I think we need to uh, measure 
advertising more by the standards of content, which is, is this enriching? Is this helpful? Is this useful? Does this, you know, wow, does the advertising actually be part of the thing that brings people back to the site? Because if you think about the magazine world, you buy Vanity Fair and you buy Vogue and I buy Backpacker because I like the outdoors. I buy it because I want a sixth tent, right? And I want to see uh, who's come out with the new tent, which I really don't need. Uh, just like you don't need a 20th dress, but you want to look at them. Um, so those experiences, we have some way to go. Uh, I think you guys are, are doing a lot in that area, actually, to try and try yeah, make I that happen. Yeah, I think the question is really uh, an important question. And, you know, and I, I come from a very simple and simplistic point of view, which is advertising when relevant is highly desirable. I, there's, you know, even the previous speaker spoke about you know, Super Bowl. You can't separate an event-based television in America uh, advertising from the actual content because it's such an integral part. Um, I think how the web will evolve is very similar, which is we saw in Web 1.0 um, sites, search, and portals as the main metaphors, so as to speak. If you look at Web 2.0 and you know, at some level just distance yourself from all the technologies that are coming out, what the technologies are ultimately doing are driving the usage of you and us as a consumer to more and more sources of content. And my, my analogy would be, you know, you take the tent analogy or a spa analogy. In print media, you, 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 know, you have a magazine like a content nest traveler. And they choose in an editorial schedule once a year or so when they think covering spas is most important. Uh, well, all women don't look for spas all at the same time. And that's the beauty of the internet that when you want to look for spas, you go out and search for them, and remarkable, only the articles come to you. So when Condé or NBC are, are looking at themselves and going, wait a minute, we don't like this because the consumer is not searching by brand of media first, which was the original question. They're searching topically, and what that does is it completely equalizes the power that was in packaged media because we go to all those articles and the authority part of media, which is a very interesting, I just looked at some uh, Nielsen TV numbers which said the web is the least authoritative medium, uh, all, only about 14% of all media, but it is the most influential medium already. And what that means is the typical authority of you know, books or magazines or curated content in terms of editorial has a very different meaning on the internet um, because you, you read it in a much more personal way. And I think that means advertising has to evolve with Web 2.0. It's almost like you need web, advertising 2.0 to understand well, that. Ask, I was, I was, just on that point, that's, that's, um, I, I think what you're describing is, is editorial, right? So mm -hmm. um, the, the point is, um, j just as um, you know, an editor will pick great articles for me for a particular magazine or newspaper, and that's why I'll associated yes. with that brand and read that magazine or that newspaper, they actually are also very good at picking advertising that will work That's very correct. well with me. I mean, sort of, you know, of course, there's a commercial element there and, yep. and a higher bidder will sometimes win and so on, but fundamentally, that's what's going on. Now, you can do that in a very scalable way on something like search because the, the fundamental unit of choice yes. is very, very simplistic, right? It's this keyword. And you actually open it to the, to the audience, sorry, to the, to, the, to the advertising network of, of, or the network of advertisers, I should say, who select themselves where they want to be. And then there are algorithms which decide when it's less or more likely, as, as you pointed out, Tim. But it's difficult to do that in a, in a, in a way for non-product non oriented or non-direct marketing oriented marketing, right? So how do you know that if you get someone like Tim who is looking at you know fancy tents and, and likes that kind of thing Very will fancy. react will react <laughs> well to you know a particular cool new Swiss yeah. watch that is aimed at people who have a sort of an adventuring mentality. Now yeah. it's not a tent, it's not directly related, but it might fit you know the profile that someone like him would fit, and that that's the real complexity, right? Because you can't the the power of Web 2.0 is the fragmentation, is the scalability, yep. essentially. The fact that there are millions of people doing millions of things. You see that with the, the, the new system that we saw earlier, um, social media, where you know, to, to, hmm. the, the argument there is you can't have editors for content anymore. You have to have the community editing yep. for you, right? So who's going to edit advertising for that, for that audience? So I think it, it, yes. it, it brings us to something that I think we are still all working out, which is the social contract with the user. Yep. So I think that the, the point is come through pretty clearly is that advertising is going to drive the ecosystem and the social contract on TV is pretty clear. 
you know, I get a lot of ads and I, I watch TV or I pay for cable. Um, but on the web, the ads that work best are the ones that are most targeted. And the most targeted means generally, you know, you want to know something, whether it's uh, aggregate or even personal information about the user. And I think we're still on the edge of working out how does that interchange work? Are users comfortable sharing a depth of information and getting much more relevant advertising, but advertising that some may consider intrusive? That, that kind of level yeah. of social yeah. contract, I think, is still fairly nascent. I think it's one of the things we're, well, talking, we're talking about. about I mean, Saranga is an interesting position because I don't think it's unfair to say that video in general and video search in particular are among the most immature areas of the internet, the last things are there for a variety of reasons. At the same time, it's dealing in an area we call television that's actually pretty well known and very well charted. So you're simultaneously very leading edge, but there's a fairly well known idea yep. about how do you, what are you seeing in the years that you've been doing this? How, is, how are people's usages of video search changing? And how might that play into an advertiser question? Sure. Um, so um, the, uh, the the really interesting thing about video advertising is um, we've seen people come at it from both directions. So on the one hand, you have people who come at it from a classic internet direction, which is make it super targeted, super contextual, um, you know, very sort of direct marketing oriented. So it's it's basically you know fusing the consumption of a video with something a bit like a search ad experience. Um, we are very good at that. Uh, part of our technology allows us to actually understand the words that are spoken in a video and the visual images that appear in a video. So um, if we you know, hear someone mention the word Paris, we can immediately slap up an ad for you know, Expedia um, cheap flights to Paris or a hotel in Paris or whatever else. Um, but of course, that's not really what you ever do with TV. You do sometimes, but generally speaking, if you move outside sort of you know, shopping channel sort of territory, that's not the way television advertising works. Um, so the other way that people are coming at it is the exact opposite, which is the way you get TV advertising, which is you know, we pick a generic um, a demographic or a particular channel of content, and we do classic branding advertising. So before you watch you know, entertainment videos aimed at you know, 20 somethings, you will get a five or 10 second pre-roll from Coca-Cola because Coca-Cola wants to hit that demographic in this particular geography at the moment. And the, the fascinating thing is the two are colliding in the middle because on the one hand, people want the targeting and the position and the sort of response that you get with search, which is, it's like a, it's a powerful drug. You know, once an advertiser gets used to that idea that I can only spend, I can spend money only on the ones that I know work, it's difficult to give that up. Um, but on the other hand, that doesn't, you know, doesn't let you capture that sort of, the, 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 the exciting sexiness that brand advertising can give you in a very, very, in a, in a very sort of undefinable way. It's a very serendipitous thing. You, you didn't know that you were looking for that ad, but actually you quite enjoy it because you happen to be reading, you know, Condé Nast Traveler and, and it's just that, it's just that, it's giving off that vibe. So we've tried very hard to combine the two, which is, you know, give people a branding experience, um, attach the brand and that sort of visual emotive component to the video, but try and do it uh, whenever possible when the video is relevant to that particular brand or that particular idea. But it's a very hard balance because it's a non-obvious connection, unlike, say, search, where you can just tie a word to the ad. I think, you know, just a, a you short... Can up front, by the way? Sorry. Yeah, like, right. a sh you know, a short comment on that would be, uh, you know, if, if, again, if you look at how advertising is spent today, uh, direct response is about 17% of a typical CMO's budget today. Um, if you look at the internet being at roughly 7% of total spend, with Google being half of it, and direct response display being the half of the remainder, that means 75% of internet advertising today is direct response based, which means the first phase of the internet is really moving classifieds and direct response, middle of the night advertorials from San Diego in America, if you know what I mean, the 1-888-800 calls. That's what's moved to the web. Um, if you really, you know, continue that line forward, that will continue till we hit probably 50% or 60% market share of direct response because stuffed envelopes and direct response and other media are not going to go away. They will decrease as a percentage, um, but will not go away. Um, the 70% of where ad advertising is spent in traditional media is in, in brand response. And the reason is very simple. If someone is asking for a car dealership by zip code or postal code for a BMW, it's actually very, very hard to have their brand preference switch to buying a Volvo, for example. And if you can, it's probably just price-based. So those things, as most marketers know, work only at the end of the funnel. What you have to do is go way in the early part of the funnel 
And the answer is very simple. And the examples I use, you know, uh, is if you if you're as a woman on a Manolo shoe site, uh, that's editorial. It's not very hard to figure out the context, the audience, and how to and how to engage them. It's actually not very hard. You can very quickly figure out other shoe ads may not work. Handbag ads work very well, and that's it. You know, so it sounds very complex when you start with a mass of I have all these users, all these ads, I don't know what to do with them and how to target them. And that takes the technologies like here and uh, the search technologies to find relevance. But if you start on the other end and say, we will introduce slowly the notion of programmed, curated editorial by audience and vertical context, it's actually very, very simple. You doesn't need rocket science then. The, the rocket science is how do you manage scale when you start, like Glam does, reach about 88 million unique visitors a month. Then the technology is needed for scale, not necessarily for the, you know, the technology. So it's much, much simpler if you break it down to much simpler context is the way I look at it, in which you can pull this advertising together. Um, and the response to those ads is incredible because people feel understood that they're in these content sites with advertising that also recognizes and validates you as opposed to give you the, you know, the first ad you see of hit the monkey or punch the monkey invalidates the entire premise. Uh, and the equivalent would be open the New York Times and you see a Cartier ad, you see a Louis Vuitton ad, and right at the bottom would be punch the monkey. Imagine what would happen to New York Times if they did that today. It would be very hard to ever get the Cartiers back, right? That's the problem with trying to do it ad hoc. You've got to separate these out. I'm a big believer. If you're premium, be premium. If you want to be Walmart, be Walmart. Don't be, don't be in between. It's very hard to be in between. Okay, we got, uh, we're out of time. We've got time for one question, which Esther's going to do. Okay, I, I want to re-ask Teresa's question because I don't think she got an answer. But I also want to, to broaden it slightly. You asked, so what's the difference between editorial and advertising? And to me, the most important thing is there's a real distinction and everything is okay as long as the advertising discloses that it's advertising. But I th think the question that really faces all of you that I haven't heard anything about is, is the fact that we're still talking about advertising stuck in the middle of editorial or snuck in perhaps through the editorial. But what happens to call it the difference between editorial advertising and user generated? There's both user generated content slash editorial and user generated advertising. Marketers need to figure out how to use the users as their allies. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, what you're doing is you're selling to some users to persuade or influence other users. If your product isn't good enough to do that, you should go home in shame, which is, I think, a great thing for the consumers. But where does, where does the fact that you need to talk, you need to listen to people, not just talk to them as advertisers, fit into all this discussion? I think, I think it's a great, I think there's, uh, they're beginning to be ads where you can interact more with the ads. For instance, at the very simplest level, you know, good, bad, good ad, bad ad, right? That's the first step. But then taking that ad and forwarding it and sharing it I mean, you can see that with some of the, the, the video treatments you're beginning to see where you can share the content of the ad. So I think it's starting, and I think it's, uh, I mean, it, it makes a lot of sense to turn the consumer into the evangelist for your brand or your product. But how about getting the user figure out which ad I will let you show on my content? Yeah, I, I think that there's sort of bottoms up grassroots, yeah. like what you're talking about. So it's what you just said, Esther. It's, in the old world, it's word of mouth, right? If your product is that good and I have a high affinity for it, I'm going to want to tell my friends, virtual or otherwise, about some face cream or some something that I think is wonderful. Sorry, talking girl to girl here. Um, that's at the bottoms up, right? I think at the top down, the new internet potential social contract are the kinds of things that Saranga and um, Samir were talking about, which is if I know a lot more about the user, and I'm very selective. I don't feel like I need to fill every ad spot with an ad, but I only pick the ones that I know will be interesting to Tim because he's watched 50 mountain biking <laughs> uh, videos on Blinks. And so therefore, I tend to know, not just I'll show him lots of mountain bikes, 
but I know that people who like mountain biking also like camping, and so I start to show him camping gear. You know, he's not going to reject it. In fact, he might actually choose to interact with that ad because it's exactly the $10,000 tent that he was looking for. I think, Esther, the way I would answer it very <laughs> briefly would be you have to look at how people interact as consumers. Um, in most opinions or Yelp-like websites, the steady state you see is 11 to 12 percent of consumers actually give any feedback and about four, three to four percent do reviews. In general, of, the, of all human community, um, you know, we are obsessed with interaction because we are in those influential circles. But if the minute you drop out of the influence circles, most people, they may feel it, but they actually don't move their mouse and do a click and, and don't want to be engaged that way. So the way we look at it is about 25 to 30 percent of our revenue comes from those spots where the influentials actually want to directly interact and not only you know, select advertising, but in many cases, do the advertising, as you were saying in the early part of your question, because that's your fan base. Um, I think for marketeers, um, influential marketing, which is a very deeply interactive, is very critical on the internet because the influentials have moved to the internet. So that's the way I look at it. And these influentials have got to get off the stage so that the next group of influentials can come up as quickly as we can because we're going to be behind. So thank you, Pam.